Gold was above $1,900 the last two days, slightly below today. Um, <laughs> Dan, the amazing headline. Uh, apparently, the first several trillion dollars of stimulus were not enough. And on top of that, we have an election coming up. Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And I'm excited to dig back into the gold and silver markets as we have a habit of doing here on Arcadia Silver Talk Radio, Gold and Silver Talk Radio. I'm joined today by my new friend, Dan Wilton, <laughs> who is the CEO of First Mining Gold. And yes, that is a company that is Keith Newmeyer's gold company that he started and now Dan runs. So he's going to be telling us a bit about that. I'm in my gold mine. Dan, I'm going to go back and show them what I showed you. First of all, Dan, Dan, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing well, Chris. Thanks so much. And for those of you who want to see, this is Chris at the mine face. He's, uh, he's fading into gold in the background. We just, I said to him, he just needs to get a proper pickaxe and then show us a big, you know, high grade gold sample. And, uh, He'll be able to declare victory on all of this. Look so. Look at what I found, Dan. Um, <laughs> although I know Dan's not impressed because he runs a gold company. So he's already miles ahead of me. <laughs> although uh, Dan, to stay miles ahead of uh, the financial markets, and especially for any folks, uh, if they're just getting assaulted with mainstream uh, coverage, saying Tesla is undervalued, even though it's up over tenfold in the past year. <laughs> Coincidentally, when the swap line started, here we see as we are recording Wednesday afternoon, uh, gold was above $1,900 the last two days, slightly below today. Um, <laughs> Dan, the amazing headline. Uh, apparently, the first several trillion dollars of stimulus were not enough. And on top of that, we have an election coming up. So what, what, do, you, what do you say to that? What do you say to that? Well, uh, you know, we were talking a bit before, Chris. I, I have the, the luxury of being a bit of an impartial observer, being a Canadian and based up in Canada. But we, uh, we watch the blood sport of US politics uh, very closely. Listen, I, I think um, you know, the election, is, someone put out a, a decent piece in the last couple of days, basically saying it's win-win for gold, right? Um, and I think what you've just pointed to there uh, with the Federal Reserve that's, you know, claim very, very clearly given up um, any of its moral authority around uh, trying to fight inflation. It's given up on that thought. And, you know, this is, a lot of people don't appreciate this is just an absolute sea change in economic policy, right? We, this, this is the, the, the main focus of the central bank since the 1970s has been fighting inflation. The challenge is there's just not that many of us who really remember what inflation did. I mean, you know, I was, I was uh, uh, born in the early 70s, so I wasn't making economic decisions in 1980. Um, but you know, my parents were, and in fact, my dad saved a large part of my university education money by buying like government bonds at 17% in the early eighties. Right. So, but we forget that, um, that this was an issue, but with the fed having given up on that, what that means is this is now just a ticket to unlimited stimulus. And we're sitting in a place now globally, you know, they're talking two or three trillion dollars in the US. The reality is globally, we're at about $20 trillion of stimulus that's been pumped into economies. And even this morning in, in Canada, they're talking about the Bank of Canada having, you know, uh, the, the authority and the right and, and the intent to continue, um, you know, open market activities for the foreseeable future. So, What's this going to do to the gold price? I mean, irrespective of who wins the election, uh, you're either going to have uh, the same policies that have continued from, from this uh, current administration, or you get into an administration that is going to then just pile fiscal stimulus on top of monetary stimulus. Um, and no one's talking about a deficit. 
<clears throat> no one's having the grown up discussion about how we're going to pay for all of this stimulus. The answer is the stimulus gets paid for by the erosion of accumulated wealth in the economy. It's the only way that it happens, right? So Yeah, and that uh <laughs> sure seems like it's going to happen uh in fact Dan Maybe you could help me calculate. I was watching one of your interviews with our friend Kai Hoffman earlier today. You come, you strike me as an incredibly intelligent person. So, can maybe you can calculate this for me? But what are the chances that Ben Bernanke? I like calling them all, all of them Ben Bernanke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ben Bernanke, Bernanke I just, like, yeah. you know, montage them into one. They all do the same thing. <laughs> um, what would you say is the probability that uh, Powell or whoever is the next guy pulls a Paul Volcker and raises interest rates to 18 or 20 percent? Um, well, first of all, how can they? They're not going to do that until inflation is rampant, right? And just think about um, uh, you're, you're better placed in the U.S. than a lot of other economies in that most people's housing debt is is uh, 30 year fixed terms, right? No. So in, in a lot of the world, people sit with floating, floating interest rates on their mortgage. So, you know, you raise rates and all of a sudden people go bankrupt. You're sitting in a position where not just the consumer, but the, uh, you know, the US corporate uh, is incredibly indebted. You look at the, at the debt to GDP and how it's going, that limits your ability to raise rates in the end, uh, or raising rates has a bigger disproportionate income because a lot of people are spending a meaningful portion of their, of their own personal income servicing debt. So you're vulnerable to that rise in interest rates and it has this disproportionate effect of, you know, you really throttle back expenditure. But, you know, for a lot of people that could be multiples of what they're spending now. So, because when you borrow money at 1%, you can afford 1% interest rates, right? Or two or 3%, but if that goes to 10, like the cost of that debt becomes overwhelming for most people. And I think that's the same in virtually every industrialized economy around the world right now. There's just, they, they, they claim to have this policy, you know, uh, capability, but they just, their, their hands are tied to use it and they're never gonna be able to use it until inflation is really rampant. But Here's the secret, that's kind of what they want, right? Because that inflation rampant, if you keep rates low, you're not gonna suffer um, the psychological erosion of wealth effect, right? Because stock markets, as has been demonstrated through this pandemic, stock markets, when money is free or people are paying you to take money, equity prices will continue to, you know, will continue to perform and hold their value. Um, real assets, largely things dictated by interest rates like real estate, by and large, continue to hold their value. Um, and if you can keep, keep the economy kind of going with some degree of inflation, then, you know, everyone's paychecks will increase every year, probably not at the pace of, uh, not at the pace of inflation, but it'll still be going up. And so you won't feel as poor, but in the end that slow and insidious grind gets to the like the the pension and savings assets of of society and that's where you really kind of get to the tricky point is how are pension fund managers going to protect themselves um how are they going to you know make sure that they're if you're buying u.s government bonds today you're paying a negative real interest rate like you're paying someone to hold your money so what's a little, bit, the, a little what's, bit of a problem for them fixed income investors isn't it well, it's the reality, right? And right now they feel good because in the last, you know, in the last nine months, that interest, you know, the, the bond that had a 2% yield that's now trading at a 1% yield, you know, it's maybe doesn't double the value, but pretty close. So they've seen capital gain offset on the erosion of that, of that ongoing investment yield. Um, but that's, that's a real challenge for um, people who are relying on that fixed income going forward. So that's, you know, uh, that's where ultimately when we have the grown up conversation about how we're going to pay for all this stimulus, it's kind of the only thing that can happen because I'm sure you could imagine what happens 
in the United States of America when some government proposes an 18% value added tax on, on purchases, right? Like, you know, the Boston Tea Party was ugly. Um, you know, this, the U.S. is a country that really doesn't like taxation. It's we're not, and amazingly, we're exponents of what they were revolting over of the Boston. I think it was like a couple of basis points compared to <laughs> where we're at now. Although, Dan, I guess taking what you just said a step further, it's like even in this election, I did not watch the debate. I, I felt there's better uses of one's time. Yeah, unless, Dan, was. unless you throw your hat in the ring for president i would vote dan wilton over no and i can't biden. unfortunately you know foreign born uh i'd be disqualified but <laughs> i mean i'm sitting there listening to you talk i'm like wow what what would and maybe i was joking when i started to say this out loud but i mean it's like what i wonder what the world would be like if people like you were implementing policies like these that lead businesses to be successful rather than politicians that usually I'll leave names out of it, but don't, I don't think they're, we'll, we'll leave that aside. But it's like in yeah. the end, you know, you mentioned the adult conversation, yet if we're this late in the game, there's no talks about cuts. There's no talks about, uh, you detailed quite eloquently how, why the Fed will never raise rates because they can't. Yeah. So, and, and you can't cut enough, right? You can't cut enough out of a government budget to find you know, another $3 trillion. And it's, it's interesting, you know, what, what, what really caused the gold price to run in 20, 2009 to 2011 was you know, just to put it in context, right? Global financial crisis, which in hindsight looks like kind of a speed bump relative to, <laughs> relative to this pandemic. Honestly, that was, you know, it, it ran because the, the imagine, if you can imagine this, Chris, the United States government was going to run a $1 trillion deficit in 2010, a trillion dollar deficit. Uh, well, you know, the dirty secret is they were running a trillion dollar deficit before COVID and no one talks about debt ceilings anymore. Like it's, that's kind of ordinary course. So now you've just poured, you know, five times that of fuel on the fire. And you're going to be doing that every year for the next few to try and stabilize the economy. Um, yeah, it's, there's, there's no reason in my mind why gold can't be multiples higher than it is right now when you factor in ultimately um, not just that people are going to try and protect their, their wealth, right? And that's having an independent uh, real asset, call it a real asset, um, in a way that real estate is not quite as real an asset. It's dependent on different things, but basically a, an unmanipulatable currency. Uh, people will argue that gold's manipulated, but you know what I mean? Like something that is not a fiat currency that will have an ability to um, survive and thrive from the race to the bottom that every other government is engaged in, in this rampant monetary expansion, right? Um, and when the pension, when, when the world of pension funds wakes up to realize, you know, maybe this is something we should own some physical gold, or maybe we should own some, some more gold equities. Like they're, they're very underexposed. Um, as that drive for portfolio protection comes in, um, the reality is we're a pretty small sector, right? It doesn't take a whole lot of capital come in to move things um, in really meaningful ways. And so that then says to investors looking here, if you're thinking about gold for the first time, as a lot of people are, you know, what's my balance and tolerance of risk of holding physical metal versus holding, you know, large cap gold equity producers versus holding developers with some more leverage to the rise in the gold price. Yeah, really some great points you mentioned there, Dan, because again, you have these pension funds and, you know, they have liabilities, obligations to meet. And that's the one, one of the problems of a, uh, you know, Ponzi scheme, hyperinflation monetary system, because, all right, well, they, the, the yields keep getting cut. And so now you have people that are, that are supposed to be, you know, re saving for retirees, and they're investing in junk bonds. I mean, does it yeah. sound a little bit like what happened with subprime and yeah and they're not junk bonds they're they're holding equities because you're getting dividend yields of four and five percent right but equities can go down 
you yeah. know, it's, uh, it's, it's the supply of money when, when people will pay you to take money and you can basically borrow it at, at negative real interest rates and funnel that into an equity market. That's kind of explains what, where we are right now. But for those, for those who, who don't think it can happen, you just need to, um, you know, it's, it's not like this hasn't happened since the Great Depression, right? Um, just go back and study what happened in the 70s and 80s. It was a pretty tumultuous time. Um, I have my own kind of personal experience with hyperinflation. Uh, I spent a few months in Russia in the, in the mid-1990s after, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I was studying Russian language in St. Petersburg, living with, um, uh, with a, a, a couple who were pensioners, and they were kind of renting me their room. Um, and this is, this is exactly the issue when we talk about all of this uh, problem with inflation. Like they were basically on a, on a fixed pension, um, which made sense, you know, let's call it a hundred rubles, a uh, hundred rubles a month, which was in 1989, quite a bit of money to go to the shop and buy food. And they had a car and they had a flat had an apartment. So, you know, they were kind of set up. Well, the problem was that when they ultimately made the Russian ruble convertible and, you know, the exchange rate came in and hyperinflation when I was there, it was 5,000 rubles to the dollar, right? So you're, you know, one, whatever, one, one thousandth of a, of a dollar of your pension is worthless because it was inflated away. And that's happened in a lot of places. So, um, you know, it, it just, has always left me with this view of, you know, you want to have not all of it. If you put all your money into gold, that's just a different form of speculation. But like you have insurance for a reason, right? And this is a real opportunity that if someone's looking around, just recognize that almost everything in your life is, is pegged to some fiat currency or other, and just have some diversification around it. Yeah. Dan, I don't know. Maybe we could add a Fed chairman to the, the list. <laughs> because actually, it's too bad you weren't here for this moment. But let me just end by saying that nobody really understands gold prices, and I don't uh, pretend to really understand them either. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. <laughs> so it seems like you might have been able to explain it to him. And Dan, I'm going to play a second of this again. I think my favorite part is how the man in charge of the world's reserve currency that people of all income brackets across the globe, it affects. Now, keep in, where did the dollar come from? It was supposed, like you talked about the 70s. I think we're personally witnessing the London Gold Pool Part 2, the collapse mm. of that. And so that, that this man doesn't know. And then it, it, listen to how they all giggle as if this is hilarious. Which on one hand, it, like it is, but it's, it's not. And I don't uh, pretend to really understand them either. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Yes. You know, uh... yeah, it, and all I can say about the gold price from that perspective is, um, yeah, you know what? It uh, it doesn't trade like another commodity. Um, there are parts of it that are irrational because uh, you know every ounce of gold that's ever been produced is pretty much still in existence. Um, but for 5,000 years, it's what mankind has been leaning on in those moments of instability. And, uh, you know, we were doing a calculation the other day. I was just, you know, musing with some friends of mine um, and actually uh, tried to do the calculation of if you had a backpack that could carry, uh, you know, an X amount of weight, 40 kilograms, let's say, how much if you had stacks of hundred dollar bills versus gold you know <laughs> who would be able to carry it like you know a million dollars worth and uh it turns out you know for all that it's got all these kind of qualities a little bit of gold still worth a lot of money in the event that you ever needed to you know hit the road in a hurry so can't travel yeah. too quickly with 40 kilograms of gold bricks on your back but still you know, it's uh, it's more portable than the equivalent stacks of hundred dollar bills. So, yeah, or you could just get some leverage, pick up some good mining shares too, and we'll get to that in a second. Although, there you go. I got one final one. 
So we looked up, let's call the gold price 1885 divided by the, I know there were two, it was like a two tiered system, but we'll use a $42 price from when Nixon, <laughs> but we, hopefully we can talk again. We'll dig into the Nixon announcement. I have so many thoughts on that. But 1885 <laughs> divided by 42, I get 44.88. So that means since the last time the rig gold system collapsed, gold's gone up almost 45 times. So if it were to go up almost 45 times from the current price, that would be about $85,273 per ounce. And Dan, I would just remind folks that, in fact, I, I'm gonna be careful this. Like, I don't know, uh, <laughs> won't give away a free ounce of silver. Well, I mean, I don't know. I would say if, if someone can explain where's the flaw in what you're saying, because I don't see it, because you laid out how we have a set of conditions that there's, I mean, it's almost incredible where it's like, you know, we talked about, you know, people talked about this 10, 20, 30 years ago, but it's like, now we're here and there's still like, not only aren't there any talks, they can't, it seems like they're really going to drive this thing until it implodes at some level, how long that takes, we will see. But Again, that's why I don't know what the timeline is. And if someone needs income next month or next quarter, by all means, mining shares or gold, probably not the way to do it. But if you have the advantage of patience and time on your side, and I mean, it, am I missing something there? Or is no, that clear listen, I, 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 think, I think you're spot on. The other, the other way that I think about it, um, and I've been, I've been reflecting on this quite a bit over the last six to nine months, um, you know, I've been doing this for a long time since the early nineties involved with financing mining companies. And I remember a few cycles before, you know, the big cycle of 04 to 2011. Um, just ask people and ask people who've followed gold for a while, like how important was May of 2006 in your, in, in your consciousness as a gold investor. And most people say what happened in May of 2006? I don't remember at all. So that's really the first time that gold traded consistently above kind of $600 an ounce, 600, 650. That was other than a very brief period in, um, in uh, 1980, a couple of trading days where gold had gone up to 800, 650 was kind of a really toppy price, right? It was double that long-term, more than double that long-term base set in 99, 2000, 2001. And, 260, 270, 300 was kind of always considered the low gold price. It went up to 400, 450, it came back to 300. So in that context of the cycle, um, you know, gold hit 600 and people said, oh, this is feeling really toppy. I remember being in the Denver Gold Show in 2006 and people said, oh, well, you know, we're in a great gold market, gold 600 bucks uh, and it's going north and it did. But you look in, in hindsight, no one remembers that, right? Yeah, and so I think you look now, gold at $2,000 is kind of double that low that it hit in 2015, 2016, 1050, 1100. It's kind of up double. People are saying, oh, this feels really toppy. It's having trouble, you know, testing the, the all-time highs. Gold today is sitting at or around, you know, the previous all-time highs prior to this run. Um, and I think we're going to look back here. And this is just basically going to show, um, you know, there's, there's no reason. Gold from 600 to 2011 tripled, right? In that five years, gold went from 600 to 1800, 1900. There's no reason why we couldn't see $6,000 gold very easily as a tripling of, you know, it's kind of 6X trough to peak. And I've seen a few of those, what's the trough to peak gold price run in any part of the cycle. I think you could see it. The great thing is for our projects, we don't need, you know, $4,000 gold. They're, they're worth a lot at $4,000 gold, but we don't need it. Like 1500 is a really robust gold price. And you're going to see it more uh, focused onto the developers soon, I believe, because there's just no productive capacity waiting, you know, waiting to be built. Because there's been no investment in productive capacity in the gold sector since 2012, 2013. So that segues into the into the microeconomic part of the uh, the next part of the chat, I guess. But uh, yeah, no, the the supply demand of gold, the you know, 
the productive capacity of the industry and, and a very short mine life industry wide, um, you know, I think it's going to be really positive things for gold developers. I sure think so. Uh, again, I pulled up a second ago. Here's the Fed's balance sheet just from 2008. So first 95 years of the Fed, you know, less than a trillion. Now you see that go vertical. So I appreciate you pointing out that, yes, I mean, silver may, silver stocks, I mean, they're still doing all right here, you know, given the last couple of years. But certainly gold, we're not talking about one day or, you know, some hypothetical, uh, you know, when your grandkids are, you know, manipulation, this or that. The price is already there. These companies are going to be making a lot of money. And Dan, I know you offered to stick around and record a uh, nice profile of what you're doing at First Mining Gold. But before, uh, perhaps you could just give uh, folks a couple of bullets of what they're looking at, the profile, what type of risks, uh, what stage you're in so that uh, people are looking for that. It'll be perfect. And then they can come and click and hear the uh, expanded version. Sure. So First Mining Gold is developing a portfolio of gold projects. All of our projects in Canada in great jurisdictions. Uh, our largest project and our, our, uh, our most advanced is the Spring Pole project, which is a 5 million ounce open pit project that we're currently uh, uh, completing a pre-feasibility study on and rounding the corner on, uh, on the environmental impact statement, which we aim to have submitted by next year. So this is a project that in the timeframes of environmental permitting, we're hoping to have our EA approvals in 2023. Uh, and we keep saying this is this is a world class project that the industry uh, is going to need, and we're going to have it ready at the time that the industry needs it the most. So very robust, big project. With the balance of our portfolio, we've been trying to move it from um, you know assets that at the beginning of the year a lot of people saw as liabilities because we had to spend holding costs and keep moving these projects forward. But these are million ounce deposits in great jurisdictions in Canada, many of them past producers with great infrastructure. And we found a couple of partnerships now where we can, you know, we basically have, have taken about $250 million of value and crystallized it one way or another into our market cap, which today is around 330, 340 million Canadians. So it's still, incredible value for our biggest project. I'd argue you're still getting it for free inside First Mining. So uh, developer, um, lots of leverage to a rise in gold price and particularly with the robust economics around our Spring Pool project. So more information, our website there, www.firstmininggold.com. Although Dan, I sure appreciate that you're kind enough to stick around. And folks, to get a little more in depth about First Mining Gold, stay tuned because that video is coming your way now.